Matt Harmon here of Reception Perception. It's time for episode three of the Reception Perception Mailbag, a post-free agency fallout. Reception Perception Mailbag, let's get into it. All right, first question up we've got here, Zam, Dan, C, uh, you know, whatever. I'm never good with these Discord handles. Remember, the questions come in from our Discord, our Reception Perception Discords, free to join. There are premium channels, obviously, for our site members. The link is in the description box down below. So, first question. In a recent pod, you were not warm to the idea of Hollywood to the Chiefs. Now it happened. Do you like it or no? So, I, the reason I think I wasn't warm to it on the podcast before it happened is I thought they might have to pay too much. To get Hollywood Brown, I thought that he might be a guy that commanded a pretty big deal, but he didn't with the Kansas City Chiefs. They got a little bit of a Patrick Mahomes discount, I think, on that deal with Marquise Brown. One year, $7 million, up to $11 million. I love signing Marquise Brown for that uh, value there. Marquise Brown's a pretty good player. I mean, he's, he's definitely got limitations. We've talked about it on the show before. 50%-ish success rate versus man coverage last year, anywhere between 50 to 63%. Not great. Um, he's much better against zone coverage. When he's healthy, he's actually a pretty good zone-beating receiver. I think he makes sense as that flanker receiver outside for them who can move into the slot, which allows them some versatility with Rasheed Rice, who's a guy who should line up mostly in the slot as more of a power slot, but he can play a little bit of flanker as well. I still think Kansas City does need to and should and will pursue an ex-receiver prospect in the first, second, or third round of the NFL draft. Marquise Brown should not preclude you from that, but I do like the signing of Marquise Brown because they got a nice little discount there. All right, next question up here, we've got Contino. I've talked myself into Deontay Johnson on the Panthers as their number one. Adam Thielen was very useful at the beginning of the year. Am I delusional? Uh, No, I don't think you're delusional. I actually don't think the whole Adam Thielen kind of empty calories production really has anything to do with Deontay Johnson's value in Carolina because they're not going to play the same position. Uh, Deontay is going to be an outside receiver. I would guess based on the fact that they wanted to talk to Mike Williams and Michael Gallup, just traditional X receivers, that they maybe see Johnson as a flanker receiver off the ball, which he had a lot of success. Talked about this on a recent podcast episode as well. And in his reception perception profile, had some success playing flanker last year, actually at his highest yards per target, a generally worthless metric, but had uh, his highest yards per target playing that flanker position with uh, George Pickens being a pure X on that offense. So Johnson can line up anywhere for them. But yeah, listen, Bryce Young obviously has to be better than what he was last year for DJ to have some statistical success. But this is a guy who gets open. He gets separation. Full green route success rate chart this past year. I'm pretty into the idea of him as a number one receiver for the Carolina Panthers. I'm a Johnson. I'm a Deontay Johnson fan. Generally have been high on his game. I like the move for the Carolina Panthers. Next one up, we've got A. Coke. Two, five, three. How do you see the Bills wide receiver room shaking out with Curtis Samuel? So there's going to be a whole Curtis Samuel video on the channel. So make sure to subscribe and check that one out. We'll do a full breakdown on Samuel and how he fits into this receiver room. However, just off the cuff here, I think people are limiting Samuel in terms of him. They think he's like a gadget player, a a a create-a-touch type guy. No way. This is a guy who's been over 75% success rate versus man. Every single year I've charted him. He can win downfield routes. He has shown an ability in his 2018 and 2019 season with the Carolina Panthers to be a flanker receiver, to win as that off-ball man coverage beating receiver. I think you could very much have a wide receiver trio of Stefan Diggs as your ex, Curtis Samuel as your flanker, and Khalil Shakir as your slot. And I also think Shakir can play outside a little bit. Like, let's not just think he's a slot-only player. So that's a pretty good three wide receiver set, and they can still draft somebody in the NFL draft if they're looking for more of a pure X long-term upside number one guy. That's sort of how I see this receiver room shaking out. Next one up comes from ST Levitate, which wide receiver stock has approved the most from initial offseason rankings to now based on free agency so far? I think two obvious answers, Drake London and George Pickens. We'll also have a full breakdown on Drake London, why he's a good young receiver, and 
why he is really a great fit with this offense in this quarterback. So make sure to come back for that. He's an obvious winner. Um, George Pickens, I also think there's a chance that the fantasy community could go too far with his target share. Right? Like he, could, could, he could have a 30% target share. Well, he could have a 30% target share in the most run-heavy offense in the entire NFL. And then he's just what Drake London was with the Atlanta Falcons. So there's a chance that we can get too steamed up with that. But I do think he's a winner because his style of play overlaps pretty well with Russell Wilson and mostly with Justin Fields as that pure man-beating outside press coverage beating X receiver who's going to run vertical routes, curl routes. Those guys can throw those routes, maybe not as much over the middle of the field. So I think he's an obvious winner. Quietly, though, I think Jamison Williams is an offseason winner so far. I don't know how good Jamison Williams is going to be. I, I'm still kind of skeptical there. The film was very up and down last year. However, the Lions didn't make any big moves at wide receiver. They might just be counting on him to be their number two receiver. Now, that means he's probably their fourth, fifth most important offensive player. So, again, don't get too carried away with that, but I do think he's got to be considered an offseason winner so far. Next one up here, we've got Packers Junkie. For more fantasy-related question, are you high or low on Demario Douglas long-term? Uh, probably a little higher than consensus, but not too crazy high. Good player, slot receiver who can beat man coverage. I do like those types. To me, it's just what is New England doing on offense, man? Um, he's definitely a guy I think I'm not going to say is a buy in Dynasty, but I think is a fine hold right now. Next one comes in from LCAB underscore zero four. I live in the Houston area. A ton of Texans fans are upset with the outcome of free agency because they believe they need another stud wide receiver. Ayuk, Jefferson, T. Higgins. Do you believe this to be the case or do they just need a better three and four? Um, I am very against the idea that they need another receiver. I think that if healthy, Nico Collins and Tank Dell are a really good one-two punch. It, you know, Nico Collins, you're not finding a better X receiver than Nico Collins. Unless you trade for Brandon Ayuk, and you're probably not trading for Brandon Ayuk, unless you trade for Justin Jefferson, and you're probably not trading, you know what, you're definitely not trading for Justin Jefferson. The the Justin Jefferson trade rumors, I, I'm going to pull out what little hair I have left. Give me a break. Uh, enough already with people speculating about Justin Jefferson trade rumors in friggin' March. We got enough to talk about. Give me a break. So no, I don't think they need a number one or a number two. I do think they need some more insurance if Tank Dell's not healthy right away to start the season. And they definitely need a better number three or number four. Like Noah Brown, Robert Woods, that's fine. But I think you could shoot a little higher for that. So maybe one more like kind of low-cost veteran. And definitely I think a day two pick in the NFL draft is totally fine. But I don't think they need to shoot that high on the veteran receiver market. Next one up here, uh, Connor Evans. Are there any stats other than your own that you feel do a good job of showing separation, contested catch, and yak ability? Um, I... ESPN's open score, I found to be pretty helpful at times. Uh, pretty, you know, overlaps pretty well with the film. I do have some, you know, big pushbacks at times. Um, there's always going to be disagreements with methodology. There are plenty of other separation stats that I, I think are fine. Um, I just, you know, I don't want to speak on other people's methodology. I, I don't really know. Um, that's it in terms of what can show separation. Um, no other stat, like you can't say, oh, percentage of contested targets, that doesn't show you separation because guys can get thrown into um, contested situations. It becomes a contested target, even if they ran a good route on the play. You know, yak ability, sometimes I push back on broken tackle stats, um, but that's obviously a good one. Yak per reception is is nice. It's just some of that stuff is going to take in the scheme uh, as well as the player, but that's fine. Um, I think you could argue that some of the yak stuff that I track probably takes into scheme as well, but that's really why with reception perception, I try to give you all the data and not condense it down to one number so that you can take in all the context and make the decisions for what you value on your own. Next one, that guy 101. What can you tell us about the Chargers wide receiver room and how that situation will shake out? Well, I can tell you right now, I think it's probably the worst wide receiver room in the NFL. Um, I, I I'm not even sure it's close. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. I'd have to think about it. But I think right now in this present moment, it's the worst wide receiver room in the NFL. So Quentin Johnson, you look at his rookie sample from the in-season rookie report. I'll have his full sample up on the site, but I, I'm not guessing that a lot's going to change based on what we saw in his rookie season. Not a guy that could, sh that showed he was ready to play in year one. Not a guy that beat man coverage. Not a guy that got open. We knew this was a big risk based on his, prospect profile that he was going to be a very raw player 
in his first year in the NFL. That was the risk of them taking him where they did when they had a receiver room that was, you know, pretty injury prone with Keenan Allen and especially Mike Williams. They threw Quentin Johnson out at the X receiver spot and it did not work in year one. I think there's you know, maybe some small percentage chance that if Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman see him as a non X receiver, they, they use him more at flanker. They move him around pre-snap, get him on pre-snap motion. I think there's a chance they can salvage Quentin Johnston's career, but it's going to take a lot of work. So he's a, still going into year two, a pure developmental project. There's no depth behind these guys. And Josh Palmer, I think, is like a fine number three receiver. So that's where the Chargers are, you know, how the situation will shake out. They could draft a receiver at the fifth overall pick, but that's a maybe. There's no guarantee there. And even then, we don't know if that guy's going to be ready to rock right away from week one. I, I do think, I mean, shoot, Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, all those guys are much better prospects than Quentin Johnson was coming to the NFL, like two tiers higher of prospect. But Regardless, it's still a rookie wide receiver you're counting on to be your number one right away. This will be a question mark headed into the season, no matter what they do in the draft. Our next one up here comes from Kentucky Bourbon Guy. Shout out. Um, who do you like more, Caleb or Drake May, and why? Um, I you know I like Caleb Williams slightly more, but I am a big Drake May fan. Uh, if you go to our channel, Derek Klassen and Zach Miller did a great job breaking down Drake May's game. Um, I'll just say for me, I think he has uh, all of the tools that you look for in a starting NFL quarterback in this day and age. Creates pretty well in the pocket, reacts to pressure well. Um, again, I would watch the class and video. Those guys do a good job of breaking that down. But I'm a fan of Drake May. If he lands in Washington, which, again, as uh, GW Stull says, or phrased differently, would you rather have Caleb or Drake chucking balls to your boy Terry McLaurin? Um, yeah, like I, I do, I, I want Drake May in Washington because Caleb's going first overall. Okay. I, I, that's not going to happen here. So if we're looking at Washington, I do want Drake May there. Um, I can see where they're at in terms of, Hey, Jaden Daniels fits in this uh, Cliff Kingsbury shooting the ball outside offense. We're not using the middle of the field that much, but man, give me Drake May 10 times out of 10. Uh, at that number two overall pick. I'm a fan of his game. I actually have a, a podcast episode on Yahoo where Charles McDonald and I go down to quarterback play there. Um, so if you want more thoughts on Drake May, you can go check that one out. Next one up here, Daniel says, with Ridley going to Tennessee, do you think he will be used in a more effective way than he was with the Jags? Yes, I'm very confident in this. Um, he talked about it in his introductory press conference um, where he said, let me run all the routes, not just the static X receiver routes. I think we're going to see that mostly because Tennessee has DeAndre Hopkins, who is a X receiver through and through X receiver. That's going to allow Calvin Ridley to play off the line of scrimmage to get tight in terms of condensed formations, be right there lined up with the guy in the slot. Maybe that's Traylon Burks, maybe somebody else. I don't know. You know, allow him those free releases going to allow him to run like Ridley said, more of the routes than just curls, comebacks, which he ran at a really high rate last year. So I definitely think he will be used in a much more effective way in Tennessee. They run a lot of those ISO routes. Um, it, well, they did in Cincinnati. I don't know if that's what they're going to do in Tennessee, but if they do that in Tennessee, really is a guy who can get separation on those routes. They desperately needed a separator, so I see why they aggressively pursued him. Obviously, it just comes down to Will Levis and how good is he um, Brian Callahan is really well thought of. I do know that. So I can understand where they're thinking in terms of Ridley and this offense. It just comes down to quarterback play in terms of what is he going to produce this season. And finally, you know, I always like to end with a non football question. I like fish 58. What a username says keep trade cut pizza, tacos, wings. Um, you know, I'll say this, your boy is on a pretty serious fitness regimen right now, pretty serious diet uh, routine. I'm not going to call it diet, just I'm, I'm, I'm eating pretty strict right now. Uh, when I do take my cheat days, there are still kind of parameters. And I, you know, I love my cheat days, but uh, there's still parameters into what I'm eating. I'm not eating pizza at all right now, okay? Uh, so I'm actually going to cut pizza in this one. Probably would have been my answer regardless of my current fitness routine. So i uh, going to cut pizza on this one. Tough choice, but... Um, you know, just just where I'm going to go with this. I'm going to, uh, man, I think I'm going to keep tacos because, bro, t 
tacos, so good, so versatile. Like you're giving me so many options when you're talking about tacos here. It could be pork, it could be fish, it could be chicken, it could be beef, it could be steak. You know, I mean, shoot, you little lengua. You know what I'm saying? Like there's so much we can do with a taco here. Corn tortilla, flour tortilla, salsa, guacamole. I mean, all kind of hot sauce, man. You could throw so much on tacos. So I'm just getting way more than I could possibly get with wings here. So I'm going to trade wings because I do think people can overvalue wings because there's volatility there. And, and you know, I like a little consistency in my life. So I'm going to one spot. The wings might be, you know, an overly fried uh, breaded mess. I go to another spot. It might be drenched in sauce with that slippery skin. I don't want either one of those. Give me a good dry rubbed smoked wing. That's what I want, but I don't know that that's what I'm going to get. So they're going to be traded for me because I think whoever I'm trading them to will overvalue them. All right, that's going to do it for Reception Perception Mailbag Episode 3, post-free agency, free agency fallout, epic edition here. We covered a lot of ground. Appreciate you all for watching. If you could, before you go, like this video, maybe leave a comment down below. Tell me I'm an idiot for my pizza take. <laughs> and maybe subscribe to the channel before you go. If you're interested in more Reception Perception content, we, of course, have the podcast with James Coe. You can find clips of that on this very YouTube channel, or you can get a subscription at receptionperception.com. We have three tiers of subscription, so there's something for everybody. And draft prospects are coming. By the time you're watching this video, there are probably draft prospect profiles on the website, and if not, they're coming very, very soon. So get subscribed to receptionperception.com today. I promise you're probably not going to regret it. No, you won't regret it.